G'day guys, welcome back to True Footy and the football come down as we unpack a wacky round 14. It was a weird round. Like, I don't know how to explain it because I think I got almost every tip right. I think I got five out of six. And yet, I'm still baffled by a number of things that happened this round. A lot of quirky outcomes. I mean, Adelaide getting five goals up or whatever against Sydney and losing because of Marty kicked nine goals. Uh, the North Collingwood game. That game was nuts. We will uncover all of that. If you're not familiar, this is a show where you guys contribute. You write comments during the weekend, and uh, I will feature them in this video. So let's go through a very interesting round. I mean, even St Kilda scoring 106 points and losing. Like, that is quirky in itself. First comment is a general comment from Max Hansen. He says, I missed Thursday night footy already. There can't be Thursday games in the buy rounds anyway, but the AFL not scheduling any more Thursday night games this year was a mistake. It works so well. I have mixed views on the Thursday night thing. I think... The downsides are if you have like your AFL fantasy team, I find that a little bit annoying because the teams come out on Thursday. As a content creator, I find that um, you know when I upload a video on a day where there's football, it generally doesn't perform that well. On the other hand, it is nice to have less days in between actual games. So I can see why people like the Thursday night game. But I have to say, why, why is it that we had a Thursday night game every week until round 14, if I'm not mistaken. I think it was just about every week. Why is it that now there's not any in the second half of the year? I have to presume this is some sort of strategic decision behind this. Is it a daylight savings thing? Like the clock's changed a while back, right? I don't understand the logic behind it. So I kind of agree with you, Max, even though I kind of do and don't like it. I certainly don't understand it. So if anyone smarter than me can enlighten me, that'd be great. First game of the week was at Brisbane versus St Kilda at the Gabba. It was, uh, yeah, another interesting game. Like I said, just the, the quirk in itself of, of a low-scoring side in St Kilda scoring 100 points themselves and not winning a game. Most sides who score 100 points will generally win a game, but um, really good fight back from them. And I think this was a tough fixture, naturally. I think the Lions, over the last six weeks, have only dropped one game. They've kind of got their act together. St Kilda have won two in a row, but there's still probably some concerns over them. In fact, I think this game was almost the most encouraging of the last three that I've seen St Kilda play against West Coast, against the Gold Coast Suns, even though they won them. The fact that they fought back hard in this game and obviously, you know, play with a bit more attacking flair was, oddly enough, probably more inspiring from them, to be honest. Lions just a little bit better for longer. 37 points up at three-quarter time. I think Danaher kicked five. It was also McCluggage. Zorko's actually also having a really good year. I've got him in my fantasy team, so it's easy for me to notice that. But he shifted more into a halfback role, obviously, with um, someone like a Kitty Coleman doing his ACL early in the year, and it's obviously paying off. He's having a wonderful season. But yeah, like I said, it's, it was a good win for the Lions. It's definitely a win that they needed. I, I think I was also just, you know, overall impressed with the fact that St. Kilda had an answer just about every time. Not enough to win the game, but they fought hard. You know, they played with a bit more attacking dare and Higgins kicked five goals. Liam Henry had a pretty good or pretty successful midfield move. We've got a couple of comments here. Uh, Callum Williams says, Logan Morris is the biggest rising star Smokey. Very consistent output, needs a big game to put him in the footy consciousness. I, I, I agree with that. When you look at it, he's kicked 11 goals from six games and I believe that puts him second to only Sam Darcy in terms of goals per game. So that's pretty good output, 191 centimeters, uh, taken sort of mid to late draft last year. Probably not a realistic Smokey because I think there's some other conditions contenders playing well right now. We'll get to someone like a George Wardlaw, for instance, but yeah, worth, worthy of a mention for sure. Naga says, Saints still a bottom four side. This might somewhat be true by default because they are probably locked into that bottom five now on the ladder. Like I said, I think there was some silver linings in this loss. The fact that they were able to put a score on the board to some extent, and I do think the Lions are tough opposition. Absolutely, especially at the Gabba. In the last six weeks, the Lions have been going all right. That being said, you know, it's probably between them and the Crows for that other bottom four spot, so we'll see. Then the Bulldogs took on Fremantle, and this uh, this game, another it was another quirky one, uh, specifically because Bontempelli was supposed to be sick, and he just, well, he was fully sick in a different way. Uh, I'm going to edit that out. Bontempelli played quite well in this game, didn't he? Three goals and 30 possessions, uh, just reminding us all how good he is. He's had a fantastic year, and is absolutely in the All-Australian team if it were going to be picked today. But Fremantle, again... Oh, I don't know if everyone watches Just the Tips, but if you watch Just the Tips, you'd think I've got every tip right this week. I switched from the Bulldogs to Fremantle. You know, I felt like my gut was actually saying Fremantle, but my head said the Bulldogs, and I changed it from the Western Bulldogs to Fremantle, only to get that wrong by 67 points. This was a very one-sided affair. The Bulldogs, their best has been very good this year. In particular, their pressure style. Like, 
I saw it in round three against West Coast and I made the comment, I was like, they are relentless with their pressure and, and when they're on, they're really on and it does help when Bontempelli gets on the end of a few. We will get to the comments because we kind of cover this as well, but I, it's funny to think that this was probably a clash between the two most inconsistent teams this season and also the best two midfields this season by clearance differential. You know, the Bulldogs, their midfield was great against Collingwood. It got well beaten last week against the Brisbane Lions. It's taken on Fremount, who were distantly the best clearance side in the competition by about a factor of three and were dominant in this game as well. So it just probably speaks to both sides being really inconsistent. We'll get to the comments. Uh, the first one says the Bulldogs are too reliant on Bontempelli. If he's gone, then they're worse than North Melbourne. Probably an exaggeration. I, I think when you have the just about the best player in the comp. I've, I've been saying that. Naturally, you're going to rely on him a little bit. And, you know, the Bulldogs aren't necessarily a top four side or anything like that. I, I think they probably still win this game without Bontempelli, though, when you consider, you know, I just thought the, the team played well in general. So I don't know if that's the takeaway I'd have from this particular week. AFL Snap says the Bulldogs continue to be the most inconsistent team ever. Yeah, like I said, I kind of just covered it with everything I said there. But, like, you look at the last three or four weeks, the, the midfield performance, some very sharp fluctuations from the Bulldogs. They're best and worst. There's still a pretty big gap. Got a few on Fremantle now. Pickle Green guy says Freeho annually fall off after the buy rounds. Yeah, I think this is the third big loss after a buy in the last three years. Samantha Jane says still can't trust Freeho. Yeah, I, I trusted them this week. They proved me wrong. Again, another side whose best is pretty damn good. Like what pre-buy they beat the D's by 100 points nearly. And it remains to be seen like what is Melbourne doing at the moment? We'll, we'll learn over time exactly where that sits. But yeah, some of their form has been really poor. I mean, there was the Western Derby um, you know, against Sydney, I know there were some mitigating factors here, but now this, like, it's starting to build up a bit of body of evidence that uh, their worst form is quite poor. Fidget Frio Man says Frio can't make up for a buy. Yeah, agreed. There does seem to be a league-wide thing where teams don't really come well back off a buy, but there was a pretty big jarring difference here with Fremantle. Let's move on to Richmond versus Hawthorne. Dusty 300th and how fitting it was for him to kick the first goal of the game. And 92,000 people there. I'm impressed. I didn't expect that. I know it's two big clubs, but consider... Where Richmond is at the moment, it was great to see the crowd get out. But naturally, it wasn't enough to lift Richmond all the way. I think a Hawthorne kicked seven unanswered goals in the second half, and they just continue this really, really good run of form. I think it's been a pretty balanced team effort from Hawthorne, but I have noticed that Will Day is actually having a really good return, and it's kind of coincided with their form. Like, I don't know if it's correlation or causation or what, but I think Will Day is, you know, he's bounced back into form really well. Um, not just what he does with the ball in hand, but also his leadership and his defensive running as well. And I think since he's been back, Hawthorne have become a significantly better side from scores from stoppage. For the Tigers, you know, other than Taranto having a great first quarter, um, they were well beaten, and um, it's to be expected. Bit of an emotional dump after last week, their big win over Adelaide. We've got a couple of comments here. Fallow-key? <laughs> fallow -key? Fellow K says, if Nick Watson could kick straight dot, dot, dot. So yeah, I looked it up. He kicked five goals, 15 this year, and I think one goal, four in this game after a couple of bags of four in the VFL. But the upside's there. He's playing really well. Tiger Walker says, Hawthorne are going to make the finals. Well, I can't disagree with you. I just did my mid-season ladder prediction this week, and I had them seventh, I think, um, which got a few comments. People disagreeing, but we'll see. We'll see. I, I could be wrong on that. The percentage not great. Young side could fall away. But it's just a gut feel at this point. Then we got the Crows and the Swans. This was another interesting game as well. For a while there, it looked like the Crows were going to score a big upset win at home. Um, you know, considering Sydney could have been due for a lull, it didn't really come, you know. Other than a great start by the Crows, they looked pretty good. Um, you know, the Amati party started to kick nine goals. That's incredible. Biggest haul of any play this year. And once again, I think Sydney just proving they have the depth of contributors. Like Brody Gundy was fantastic again in this game. Heaney bobbed up for his classic couple of goals in 25. Earl Goulden as well had 10 clearances, 35 disposals. So they definitely bested them in the middle of the ground. And Adelaide, you know, while they've been fairly efficient, like I thought their forward line was efficient to some extent this week. 35 inside 50s really told the tale. We've got a couple of comments here. Magpie says, Nick's needs to stop playing Dawson forward. It does seem odd to me that their best midfielder isn't actually getting that much time on ball. So you look at the stats over the last six or seven weeks, Jordan Dawson has other than the game against Richmond, where he attended 85% of centre bounces. The next highest was 56%. That was against Collingwood. And then against Sydney, he only attended 52% uh, of centre bounces. I don't know if this is a load management thing, but I have to agree. When you consider the concerns around Adelaide's midfield, that, that does look odd to me. Interestingly, though, I will look. I'm not making a serious point here, but I'll point out some stats here. I'm looking at the Rory Laird centre bounces attendances. And for the most part, for the last six, seven weeks, when Rory Laird has spent more time on ball than Jordan Dawson, Adelaide's won the game. Again, and it's probably correlation, not causation, but I can only think that if Dawson's only playing 50% of the time on ball, there must be some sort of fitness reason for it. We have another comment saying Amati might be a threat to the Coleman in a couple of years' time. Yeah, well, possibly. 
he's coming along nicely, I think, between him and uh, Logan McDonald. They've got a really nice one-two punch. He's kicked 31 goals this year. That is pretty good going. That's more than I'd realized. I know he's just plus nine, but yeah, 40 games of experience now. Going to turn 25 by the end of the year. Certainly, if you expect Sydney to be good for the next few years, you'd have to consider Amati will be a chance to, to go close. Let's talk about the most bizarre game of football this year. And I tell you what, if Fisher had kicked that goal right on the siren, or right before it, this might have been the best game of all time, honestly. It was just nuts. It was just nuts. They were 54 points down Collingwood. So I don't even know where to start. What was the most bizarre, not bizarre, but just like striking aspect to this game? I don't know where you start. I thought George Wardlaw for a start was amazing. Really good player. What he's doing for his age in the difficulty of role makes him different to some of these other younger skinnier types like say say Nick Dacos and I'm not saying he's better than Nick Dacos and I'm not trying to shortchange Nick Dacos I think what Dacos is doing now is incredible but what Wardlaw is doing in terms of how much time he spends in a contested situation I think is absolutely unreal and um, I think he's going to clearly win the rising star provided all things go well. Speaking of Dacos this is another interesting aspect of this game he was sick coming off an injury Another fantastic game. 29 disposals, six clearances, two goals. The tag thing was weird. Like Will Phillips coming on, doing a fairly solid job of tagging him. Will Phillips getting subbed off. And, you know, I would have thought maybe a tall might have been the more sensible option there. Dacos then has a pretty big last quarter, I think, with at least nine touches and a goal. But yeah, Wardlaw's, look at Wardlaw's first 31 minutes. This is when I think Larky that at sick goal. They're up 49 to eight. At this point, he's had 12 possessions, five score involvements, three inside 50s. That's absurd. So yeah, at one point the score was 93 to 38. I think that's early in the third quarter. And then five minutes to go in that third term, the score was 110 to 66 or something like that. And you just, I'm looking back at it and I'm like, how the hell did North Melbourne lose this game? And I'm actually not criticizing North Melbourne for that. I just think obviously they're playing Collingwood. They're a young side. Like I'm not really heaping shit on them for losing them. It's just more baffling to see that score line. Anyway, for the Roos, like I, I talked about Wardlaw. I thought Curtis was really impactful in moments in this game. Tristan Cherry's having a fantastic year. LDU also really stepped up. Collingwood was missing you know, a number of tolls obviously in their forward line. I think what ultimately was the difference was their smalls really getting to work. And Bobby Hill, like mark of the year, probably. But even the one that I think was the winner, where side bottom skews it like inbound and he'll just come from nowhere. I thought that was just as impressive. He was absolutely unbelievable. We'll get to the comments. So we've got Pixel Knight here saying North are building, kind of like the Hawks. I think it'll be slower, but to have efforts like from players like Cherry and Archer is what the team needs. Also to survive a last quarter comeback and win and then let a comeback happen will help the Roos too. Good that they were back-to-back -back games so fresh in their minds. So yeah, I suppose there will be learnings. I think the trend between both games is North Melbourne got themselves into winning position and then just probably, you know, is it fitness? Is it mentality? Is it confidence? Obviously, we, we can't say that North Melbourne have a winning culture. I think that probably plays a factor in it. But either way, you'd be absolutely encouraged by that. And there's no doubting, like, the talent that North Melbourne has. I've been pretty consistent in saying it's more of an age and experience thing. We'll see them stay low for a little bit. But he, he says when North can play four quarters, they're going to be a scary team. Yeah, absolutely. I think George Wardlaw, LDU... Those two by themselves, plus Harry Sheasel, who's absolutely unreal. Like you can see the makings of a premiership team. It's just about guiding this properly. Lackluster end of the round, I thought. GWS versus Port Adelaide was not the, the game I was hoping it would be. Um, and there's no comments on it, so we'll keep it brief. But the Giants kicked nine goals, 19. Port Adelaide kicked six goals, 15. This was a tough game to watch, to be honest. A lot was said of Toby Bedford doing a really good job on Zach Butters. I don't remember Toby Bedford tagging before. I could be wrong, but he kept him to, what, 18 touches or something like that. And yeah, he himself had 16 and one. But you look at, you know, the other ball winners for Port Adelaide. Ollie Wines, 18 possessions. Boak, 18 possessions. Rosie, 14 possessions. Other than Houston, who had about 35. You just couldn't get their hands on the footy. It is a good one for the Giants. It snaps a bit of a poor run of form, or at least it's a win in that time frame. And it is a good win and important considering the context of the season. And, you know, I still think they'll probably build into the second half of the year. One silver lining for the power. I mean, I've kind of liked what Georgiatis has done coming back into this side. Like, coming off an ACL to kick 19 from 10. I think he kicked four against Carlton. He kicked three in this game. At the start of the year, I did say in my Port Adelaide preview that I really foresaw... A changing of the guard in Port Adelaide's forward line this year in terms of their tolls, and we're starting to see that. Like, there's no Charlie Dixon, no Jeremy Finlayson. 
So there's progress there, and yeah, either way, a bit of a flat game, to be honest. Before we finish up this episode, um, Fidget Frio Man has gone to the trouble of making an inconsistency ladder. Well, I'll flash it up on the screen here, but unsurprisingly, you got the Bulldogs and Freeman on top two. I like it. That's probably fair. you got the Demons. Again, I don't know if it's inconsistency or is the arse just falling out of them. We'll see, but obviously a big gap between their best and worst. West Coast, yeah, absolutely. The poor games have been really poor. Well, a couple of them, I think, in my opinion, have been really poor. And their top form has been pretty exciting. You know, the Derby against Melbourne as well. Down the bottom there, you got Sydney the most consistent. Yeah, I mean, other than one loss to Richmond, which is a weird outlier, they have been tremendous. And I see what you're saying about Gold Coast. They're dominant at home, poor away from home. That makes them incredibly predictable. So it's kind of like an unpredictability ladder as much as anything, but I like your work. Anyway, guys, that will do for this episode. As always, I thank you for your contributions. We want to keep the momentum of this show going, keep you contributing. It's more fun when there's a lot of comments to read. So for now, I'll say goodbye. I thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.